Hey, Kevin Schmidlin here, host and producer of Philly Who. And this week, this Wednesday, is the live episode at World Cafe Live with Mike Salmanov and Steve Cook. If you join us, you'll hear the stories behind Zahav, The Rooster, Federal Donuts, and we'll also be joined by past guests Jesse Ito and Becca Craig to have a conversation about the Philly food scene. Everyone in attendance will get a taste of Kafar, which is Cook and Solo's newest restaurant coming later this year. And $5 from every ticket supports Broad Street Hospitality Collaborative. Once again, it's this Wednesday at 8 p.m. Grab those tickets now and see you there. It's amazing. I I always said that I I didn't live a life. I lived lives. And in every life, I changed. You're listening to Philly Who, the podcast that tells the stories of the doers, thinkers, and performers of Philadelphia. My name is Kevin Schmidlin, and today in this special two-part series, I'm sitting down with Tony Luke Jr. In the early 90s, Tony, his brother, and his father built and opened a small sandwich shop in South Philly. Pretty soon, everyone was talking about Tony Luke's. Philly Magazine voted us not only the best cheesesteak in Philly, but the best roast pork sandwich in Philly. Tony Luke's would turn into a household name, and Tony Luke Jr. would become the face of the franchise, starring in TV and radio commercials, and even getting his own show on Spike TV. But before his father even had the thought to build a sandwich shop, Tony Luke Jr.'s story had already taken several shapes. From being a rough and tumble South Philly kid. I grew up in a 10 by 10 block radius. Anyone out of that 10 by 10 block was not my friend. To a budding Hollywood movie star rubbing shoulders with the cast of Rocky. He's literally standing in the elevator and I go, Mr. Lowe, my name's Tony Lucidonio. How do I get in your next picture? And literally like a film, as the door's closed, he goes, you audition like everybody else. <laughs> to scoring a record deal as the crooner of an R&B band. And he says, and who are you again? What do you play? And I'm like, I'm the lead singer. And he went, no, lead singer's black. I'm like, no, he's Italian. The preamble of Tony Luke Jr.'s story to being the face of the Philly cheesesteak is part one of this two-part episode of Philly Who. And I say this with every fiber of my being. Creative and performing arts literally saved my life. Just a heads up, there is some cursing in this episode. All right, buckle up, because Tony Luke Jr.'s Philly story is a doozy. You heard it here first, there will be a movie made about this man. Now, we don't even get to the founding of Tony Luke's, the cheesesteak franchise, until part two. In that episode, you'll hear how a small sandwich shop on a random corner in South Philly that didn't even sell cheesesteaks when it first opened became the Philly cheesesteak sensation of the 90s. Tony Luke Jr. would take the momentum of a few press pieces and parlay it into viral TV commercials, multiple franchise locations, and the life of a TV and food celebrity. But the highest of highs would soon become the lowest of lows. Tony's family would have a falling out about the direction of the franchise, which would be followed by a devastating lawsuit, the end of Tony's TV show, and the heart-wrenching death of his son, Tony Lucidonio III. Now, that's all covered in part two, and I know it sounds super intriguing, but trust me, part one is just as wild. Before Tony was made famous through silly TV commercials, crazy radio ads, and really excelling at viral marketing before it was even a thing, he had a couple of really close runs at conventional stardom. You see, Tony was born to be a performer, and he's got talent. His music career got to the point where one day he was working on a song in the same LA recording studio as Michael Jackson. He actually turned down the chance to meet him so that he could focus on his song, which today he regrets, but really shows how seriously close he came to having a big-time music career. Before that, as a teenager, Tony was personally invited by a cast member of Rocky to move out to L.A. and take a crack at being a Hollywood actor. And earlier still, he was a member of the very first class at Kappa, the Philadelphia High School for Creative and Performing Arts. The two threads that are constant within the many lives of Tony Luke, for better or for worse, are performance and food. Eventually, he would find positive harmony between the two, but 
As a child, that wasn't the case. He was extremely shy and pretty overweight. As a result, in those formative years, he was picked on. A lot. I was probably maybe ten and a half. That was when you still used halves. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you're like, how old are you? I'm like nine and a half. Yeah, ten yeah. and a half. <laughs> and I would sit on the step, and there was a girl that would walk by every day. And... She would smile and wave, and I would smile and wave. And next thing you know, we would we started talking. I said hi, and I would look forward every night to being out on the step, and she would be there. And then one day, I just you know, I said you know, I'm gonna want to work up the courage. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask her out. I'm gonna do it. And what did we do back then? You know, you get a piece of paper and you go, you know. Do you like me? Yes, no. Circle Would one. you go out with me? Yes, no. Che <laughs> you know, check the box. <laughs> I muscled up the courage. I thought, you know what? You could do this. You could do this. And I, I gave her the paper. And she looked at it. And she smiled. And then she kind of got off the step. And her girlfriends were on the corner. And she went and she spoke with them. And I was just sitting uh, on the step and I had no idea what was going on. And she, she came back like five minutes later and I said, well, did you read the note? She said, yes. And I said, do you like me? And she said, yes. And I said, well, would you go out with me? And she said, I talked to my friends and they said that you're too fat to go out with. And I, I can still remember that it was, 47 years ago and you must have felt crushed well it, it just it, it it just was a an affirmation to all the teasing i got that that you know if you weren't if you didn't look a certain way if you didn't follow the norm of what everyone else looked like then no one wanted to be seen with you yeah and I remember running in to the house crying and my grandmother, God rest her soul, she was amazing. She made me feel better by cooking me pasta. <laughs> so <laughs> it was like, I had this issue. So I developed this very um, abnormal relationship with food. And I never really ate because I was hungry. My grandmother, God bless her, I mean, she, she was always trying to do the right thing. And by no means am I suggesting that she's the cause of this. I mean, I'm right, the cause right. of this. But when I sat in front of a TV with a bowl of food, these shows would come on. I'd watch all of these shows, these comedies, these TV series, and I would be someone else. And I would look at the actors and playing the different roles and I would, I would get lost inside the television with the food. So I related comfort. I learned how to cope with life's problems all the way into adulthood by eating and watching television because that brought back the feeling that I was, I was safe. It was comfortable. My grandmother was there and that also sparked my interest in acting. My grandmother, God bless her, supported me in everything I did. So I would run around like a lunatic and I wanted to sing and I wanted to this and I wanted to that. You know, I came out of my shell probably around 12 maybe and I kind of went the opposite way. I was really very introverted and afraid of a lot of things. And at like 12 and 13, I just kind of flipped and I kind of came into my own and became part of what the neighborhood was. I grew up in a 10 by 10 block radius. So anyone out of that 10 by 10 block was not my friend. Where in Philly is this? What are the like the, well, the I grew streets? Up at, I grew up at 803 McClellan Street is where I grew up. So people around the neighbor, around that 10 by 10 radius knew who you were. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I never backed down from anyone. I remember I, a dear friend of mine, his name was Nick. He was a boxer. And I couldn't fight at all, you know. But I was at that I don't care attitude. Right. Like I fight anyone. <laughs> and there was he was picking on me kind of in school a little bit, but you know he hung with the tough kids. And I remember I'll never forget it. It was like we were in um, like the basement, the lunchroom, and it was packed. And he said something to me, and I I went back at him, 
And he's like, oh, you're dead. I'm like, well, anytime you, you know, like he wouldn't do it in school. And he's like, you meet at literally like a movie. Yeah. We're meeting in the, in the, in the schoolyard, you know, at four 30 and you better show up. And literally the entire school, the classes were there. They showed up and he showed up unfortunately. <laughs> um, but so did I. And I had a really good friend of mine, Mario, and you know, he was rooting me on. Come on, come on, Tom, come on, Tom. Yeah, yeah. And needless to say, he beat the shit out of me. <laughs> but no matter how hard he hit me, I refused to go down. No matter how many times he punched me and I've hit the wall, I just kept coming at him, swinging wild and maybe i got a punch in i even doubted he was just so good there was actually one point and i could remember vividly where he stopped and he just looked at me like stop what are like, we doing just here? stop you can't win there was a part of me that just wouldn't give up and i would just kept going and then just at the height of me just taking this beating and everyone's watching it and i'm starting to feel like yeah just give me more i hear eh! It's my mother comes running into the schoolyard. No. You know, and I'm like, well, that's the end of that great moment. And <laughs> about two hours later, I heard a knock on the door and it was Nick. And it was with all the guys that he hung with. And I came to the door and I thought, oh, here we go again. And I was ready. Like, I don't care again. And he said to me, you know, you got a lot of balls. He said, but you can't fight for shit. And I said, well, I tried. He goes, look, we're going to hang out. You want to come? <laughs> and they became some of my best friends. And then I knew I had to learn how to fight. And I went to P.D. Alessi's gym, which was a boxing gym. And um, it, was, it was amazing. And it built my self-confidence. And that's when I started to, to get high on crystal meth. And then the weight just shredded on me and... You know, I was thin and I was in the gym every day. And at that point, if I was going to fight, it would have been a formidable fight with anyone. Right. That kind of led to me getting thrown out of school. Yeah. So it was, you just, you got into another fight. I and got into had, another fight and I, I hurt this kid and um, they wanted me out. But I still wanted to do the acting thing because I've always wanted to do that. And, and so it was, it was your father who... It was my father who, who said to me, you got to go back to school. My dad, I have to be honest, I, I never saw him. He worked all the time. Yeah. The man was an amazing provider. Look, we didn't have the best of everything, but we had everything we needed. No, we didn't have new shoes, but we made sure to clean the shoes we had. No, we didn't have the best house, but it was always clean. Yeah. He was a very proud man. Mm. You know what I mean? He took pride in everything he did. He worked with his hands and no one ever gave him anything and you know his father was not you know his father was uh, used his hands a lot on him and his mother mm. i think that you know being a young kid going through that kind of abuse and just being in that environment i i think what it did to my dad was he didn't become an abuser but he kind of was cold yeah maybe not physically but yeah he but never still... said i loved you he could be very very distant yeah. so anyway i got thrown out of Newman for fighting. And I went to work. My father had a commissary for lunch trucks and you know, orders would come in, we would load the trucks with stuff and then trailers would come in to drop off stuff and we would load it on the elevator. So it was really manual labor kind of stuff. And um, my father called me in the office and he said to me, I just read in the paper about this new school, this, uh, I don't know, some creative and performing arts school you want to be an actor and a singer or whatever else you want to do. He was never like, it was never his thing. My father, you know, it was like, well, go audition because you got to go back to school. You're, you're 14. You can't not be in school. You have to go back to school, go audition. Now I don't remember how many kids audition. What school was it? Uh, creative and performing arts Kappa. And they were literally auditioning for the first class. Wow. Of the school. They actually call us the originals. Really? <laughs> yeah. So here I am in jeans and leather jacket, you know, and I'm looking to just, you know, nobody better come near me. Yeah. Now remember, I'm out of my 10 by 10 block area. So to me, anywhere outside of that realm 
it's time to fight. Like literally that was the mentality. Wow. And here I go to this audition and there's Irish and blacks and Puerto Ricans and Jewish people and Asian people. Like I'm like, I, I, this is really new to me. And I had to audition. So I, I auditioned for drama and music as the minor. Okay. And I got up there, I'll never forget, and I sang Always and Forever, a cappella. And then it was time for the drama audition. And I remember distinctly how I got in the school. They put us all on stage and they said, I want everyone to pick an animal, be that animal. So I'm like, well, the only animal I know, I don't know, she I know dogs. People are being sheep and cows. I'm thinking, where do you see a sheep at? <laughs> You live in the city, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm a dog. So I'm like, I'm in my head, I'm like, really? I gotta be a dog? So I literally get on all fours and I just start barking, thinking, feeling like an, an idiot, you know? Because if my neighborhood guys could see me, I'd be like shot. Uh, yeah. So if I figure if I wanna be a dog, then I'm gonna be a dog. And I start barking. Now we were on a stage and I remember jumping off the stage and there was this amazing woman named Miss Daniels. And I jumped off the stage, ran up to her and stared at her and she looked at me and I did what dogs do. And I literally shoved my head between her knees, between her knees, not her thighs, yeah, yeah. between her knees and was like acting like a dog. And she jumped off the chair laughing, hysterical, like she couldn't stop laughing that this kid just jumped over the stage and put his head between my knees like a dog yeah. when it meets another, you know what I mean? And then everyone started to laugh. And I remember leaving and I thought either I will never be called because <laughs> I'm just too ridiculous or that was so different yeah. that I'll get in. Now, well, now I would have been arrested, yeah, charged with every conceivable... But back then, no one thought that, like, there was no malice. There was nothing sexual about what I was doing. There was nothing pervert. Like, it was, it was, a, it was a joke. It was a, just a being dog. ridiculous. Yeah, it was, it was, everyone was ridiculous. And she didn't take it any other way than he's crazy. Like, this is. But it sounds like you had the same mentality. It's like either, all right, they're going to, you know, I'm either going to be, I mean, they're going to win or they're going to kill me, <laughs> like, right. you know, figuratively. And either way, whatever, let's just figure this out. And I remember about two months later, I got a letter in that I was accepted to drama and to music. How, how did you react when you saw that letter? I couldn't believe it. And I will tell you this, and I say this with every fiber of my being, creative and performing arts literally saved my life. My views on everything changed. I actually wished that everyone from the neighborhood could have gone because then they could have really seen that it's a different world beyond the 10 by 10 block. I don't think anyone in this school was ever introduced to anyone like me. My drama teacher used to call me Rock, like Rocky, like Rock. And I was popular in high school like which was such an opposite of grade school because i was so unpopular in grade school but if if you ask me the high school days were some of the greatest days i've ever had i mean i just i learned so much and you know dance and i learned to appreciate dance more because i had to take ballet right now this is an italian kid from south philly you know 1978 taking ballet class you know i never forget coming home and my father's like, what the hell is that? And I'm like, well, I'm supposed to wear it. It's a dance skin. You ain't wearing a dance skin. I don't care what school you go to. <laughs> I'll kill you not wearing a dance. And I'm like, I got to wear the dance. You ain't wearing a dance skin. So I'm picturing like you at this time, like I'm picturing like Danny from Greece, like, yeah. you know, uh, the Fonz, the Rocky Balboa. So you, they called you Rock. Now I, I read that you actually found your way into a cast party for Rocky too. Oh, you're going to love this story. Okay. <laughs> so they're having this, I think it was at the Barkley Prime or was on somewhere on Rittenhouse now, is Square. This still while you were in high school? Yeah, I'm in high school now. So I have a, a, a really great friend who was very talented. His name was uh, Ralph Satterthwaite. And we're in school and I find out that they're having a luncheon 
for Rocky two. Now I want to be in Rocky three. So I go to Ralph and I said to him, listen, we're cutting school today. He's like, we're not cutting school. I'm like, we're cutting school. There's a luncheon. We're going to go. We're going to meet Sylvester Stallone. I'm going to get in his movie. I'm like, you want to come? You don't want to come. He's like, Are you uh, what? I'm like, let's go. Come on. Follow me. <laughs> so we leave. And I remember walking in and there's the desk. Now I tell Ralph before we go in, don't say anything. Just let me do all the talking and you just nod. So now remember, I'm 17, 16, 17, whatever yeah. year it was, whatever Rocky took him. So I walk in, I go to the front, I go, how you doing? She's like, good. I'm like, uh, I'm here for the press passes. The woman said, excuse me? The press pass for the Rocky II luncheon, me and Ralph Satisweight, press, we're press. And she said, excuse me, kid. <laughs> I'm like, first of all, don't call me. I'll never forget. I'm like, I'm not a kid. Do you ever hear creative and performing arts, the high school right here? Yeah. Well, we're the journalists for the school. Drama is our major. We're doing a story about Rocky II. Press passes were supposed to be left here for us. I'm just here to pick them up. It's, who did you speak to? I don't, re I don't you know, remember a name. I don't. Hold on. So now I know everyone involved in the, like, cause I was a real dry, like everything, who the producer, like everything. Hold on. She gets on the phone. She goes here. I'm like, hello. It's like, who is this? The guy says, says it's, it's Tony Lucidonio. Who are you? Who are you? He goes, I'm Erwin Winkler. Who are you? I'm the producer of the film. He's the producer. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, oh, Mr. Winkler. I said, I called your office. I'm um, with Creative Performing Arts, and we were doing a story on Rocky Two, and they were supposed to leave press pass. He goes, what office did you call? So now I got to think fast. Uh -oh. Now, I'm a street kid, so I'm quick. He's an act, like he's a producer. If he's got an office, it's only in two places, New York or California. And if, if anything, he's in L.A. more than he's in New York. So I go, I called in New York. I don't remember who I spoke. I put the woman back on the phone. Puts the woman back. Now, you calculated all of that just on the fly. And on the fly. <laughs> on the, well, you had to. When you're on the street, yeah. you get into a situation. Be on your feet. You got to talk your way out of it. You better be quick or you're dead. So, Ralph can't believe it. She gives me these two press passes. So, he's I'm, and I'm like, what floor? And she tells us what floor. We go up. We get off the elevator. I got the press pass. And now I got an attitude of a walk which we used to call a strut back in the 70s. So I'm strutting in <laughs> and Ralph's next to me and we get to the front and there's a little short Italian guard, like security guard. And he goes, whoa, 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 where are you going? And I already hear the South Philly accent. Where are you going? I'm like, press, press my ass. Where are you going? I said, can you read? It says press. I don't care what it says. I don't know how you got up here. I know you don't belong here. You're going to turn your ass around. You're going to go back. I'm like, listen to me, cheap cop. I said, you don't tell me what to do. I got to prep. Now I'm getting into this huge argument, literally. And this guy walks over and he's thin. He's in a three-piece suit. He goes, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. What's going on? I'm like, this security guard thinks he's some big cop. And he's trying to tell me I can't come in. And he's lucky <laughs> I don't smack him in the face. And this guy just starts laughing. And he's like, he's all right, he's all right, he's all right. They're, they're with me. He's all right, they're with me. And he goes, all right. Now, I don't know who the guy is. He goes, come with me. You sit at my table. I'm like, all right. Now, he, he takes me to this table. And it's away from all the other tables. And I'm thinking in my head, I want to be here. Yeah. I want to be with all the people. It, it's a completely, this long table, it's separate. But I figured, you know what, I'm in here. So they, he goes, what are you doing? He goes, tell me the truth. How'd you get in here? So I tell him the whole story. And Arwin you told Winkler. the truth. The whole story. I tell yeah. him Erwin Winkler, because the guy looked cool as shit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, Erwin Winkler, I told him, I called him in New York. That He didn't know anything. I pulled it over on him. And then I go downstairs, Ralph comes in, I cut school. And he can't get enough of me telling him the story. He is just laughing hysterically. So... Now I'm, I'm looking at Ralph, I'm like, what do you think? Fruit cups coming, you know, like we're going to have lunch. Now I look, and here comes uh, Car Weathers, Apollo Creed. I'm like, there's, there, and I'm looking at Ralph, there he is. Like, where's he sitting? Like, how far? 
Like, you know, because we're really, we're not close. Yeah. I mean, we're close, but we're separate. Right, yeah. And I'm like, he's coming, cl he's coming, cl coming closer. He's like, and then he comes to the table and he sits on the other side of me. And I'm like, what the hell's like, what are we, like, I can't believe this now. And he goes, and I go, how you doing? And the guy goes, oh, Carl Weather goes, Tony Lucidonio is from South Philly. And he goes, this is Ralph Satterthwaite. It's from Westwood. They're both from Kappa, Craven. He goes, oh, nice to meet you. And I'm like, oh my God, like I'm at the table. <laughs> who is this guy? Like, who is this guy? Yeah. <laughs> Because I don't recognize him, and he's super thin. And you still don't know who the guy who brought you no in is. I have no clue who he is. And I'm, you know, I've seen Rocky 800 times. You know, you live in South Philly, you saw it a million Of course. Times. Next thing you know, here comes Talia Shire. And she sits at the table, and he's in, I'm like, who the hell is this guy? And I look, and I go, excuse me. I go, who are you? Who are you? And he goes, Omega? Yeah, who are you? I'm like, that you're, you're, he goes... I'm in the movie. I'm like, I'm sorry, because the guy, you know, I, I saw the movie a million times. Are you new in, like, two? And he goes, no. He goes, you honestly don't know who I am? Like, I don't, I don't know who you are. And he goes, um, I'm Burt Young. I play Paulie. I'm like, no, Burt's fat. He goes, I lost a ton of weight because he's super skinny in Rocky right. too. Right. I didn't recognize him because he lost all the weight. He looked completely different. And it was Burt Young. And I'm like, oh my God, now here comes. So this was the best. He goes, oh, he goes, hold on, Tony, hold on. <laughs> he goes, and he, he waves the guys coming over. He goes, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine. He goes, Tony Irwin Winkler. Say hi to Irwin because I just told him the whole story. <laughs> And I'm like, Mr. Winkler, how are you? He goes, why do I know that name? Did I just talk to you on the phone? I'm like, yeah, I really appreciate the press pass. <laughs> that now Bird is laughing hysterical because he's in on the joke. No one. So we had lunch and here comes Stallone. And he sits like two seats down. And they're answering questions. And I'm like, and everyone wants to know who the hell are we? Yeah, yeah. You're at the table. With the We're at the table. So now people are like, who, who the hell are those two guys? <laughs> and... The thing gets done, and Burke goes, you know, kid, you remind me a lot of me. He goes, I like you. You come out to L.A. I'll take care of you. Uh, here's my personal number. Wow. He was awesome. And he said, "You." and I'm like, yeah, yeah, thanks. I got to see Stallone. Yeah, yeah. Like, right. Like, yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah I got to get in the movie. I need to talk to Sylvester Stallone. He starts leaving. I'm trying to get him pressed all over him. Finally, finally gets in the elevator. He's literally standing in the elevator, and I go, Mr. Lowe, my name's Tony Lucidonio. How do I get in your next picture? And I'll never forget it. And literally, like a film, as the doors close, and he goes, you auditioned like everybody else. <laughs> and the doors closed. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. After all that. <laughs> I was like, all of that. Oh, my God. At that point, you probably should have like actually written an article for the newspaper or whatever. No, I didn't know. I couldn't even speak back then. I can barely speak English now. Back then, it was even worse. Yeah. About two to three months prior to graduating, I figure, yeah, I don't want to be in school anymore. Now I'm talking two to three months. You're that close. And I go, I'm going to go to LA. Burt Young gave me his info. I'm going to LA. I'm going to be, going to be a movie star. I want to be a star. When I got, I got Burt Young. Yeah, you're set. I'm going. I'm 17. I had a, an orange Volkswagen. I sold it. I'm at the airport. My girl I was with from 13. She's crying. My mother's crying. I'm like, I'm moving to LA. Just like that. You're Kid, like, you I'm know what? Never mind. I'm out. Going. Not finishing school. I'm going to LA. You break up with the girlfriend? Pa no, well, yeah. Wow. So I have like, I got a pocket full of cash because I sold my car. My father gave me some money. Like I literally got a wad yeah. of cash. So here I am in LA. I'm there a couple weeks. I go see Burt Young. Now, I don't know anything. I figure, you know, no. Burt sends you to a casting agent. So Bert, he picked up. Oh, he did. He picked up. I went to his office. So I go to the casting agent. Now, remember, I'm from South Philly. I have no clue. Right, yeah. Now, where I come from, if someone sends you somewhere, it's taken care of. If I go, yo, you go see this guy, then you're good. 
Well, it doesn't work like that. I don't know this. So I go to this is an actual conversation I had with a casting agent. So I go and I go, how you doing? She's like, yes, can I help me? I'm like, you know, Burt Young, the actor, Burt Young. Yeah, yeah, he called me. He said you were coming. You have a headshot. Here you go. She says, thank you. And I go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, well, when, you know, when do I work? She's like, what do you mean? I'm like, I just gave you my headshot. What movie am I going to? <laughs> and she goes, what do you mean movie you're going to? I'm like, look, you're not understanding. Bert called. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, are you here? Are you feeling right, you, you right. getting it? He called. Yeah, I know. I said, well, when am I going to get a job? She said, you see all those file cabinets behind me? They're filled with thousands of headshots. I'm like, no, no, we're not, you're not understanding me. She goes, no, you're not understanding me. So now I'm pissed. I call Bert. He's on a set doing a movie. Uh, hold on. He says, he's, he's on break. Give me a minute. And I, he gets on the phone. Now, we didn't have cell phones back then. I'm literally calling from a pay phone. Wow. He's like, Tony, did you go see the gig? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, all right, good. I'm like, well, well, I'm not good. Where's the gig? Like, she didn't even know. Like, he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, she, you, you called her. I should be heading to a movie now. He goes, Tony, it's a slower process. Just relax. Take it easy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> go to my office. So he had an office on Wilshire Boulevard. I walk in, and a woman who I was on the phone with, before I went to LA, her name was Temi Rosenthal. To this day, I'm still in contact with Temi. Wow. I love her. She's an amazing, amazing woman. And I walked in. She said, now I can finally put a face to that voice, she goes. And I said, ah. and we're talking. I said, Bert's going to tell. And we just hit it off like we knew each other for 100 yeah. years. Now, she was older than me by probably 10 years, maybe. And there was a blonde in the office beautiful and i go i'm gonna go talk to her. she said no 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 tony leave her alone i'm like i just want to go talk to the girl it's like no no stay away from her leave her alone i'm like i'm just talking to the girl tell me don't make a big deal out of it. she's talking to her. so i walk in i i sit down next to the girl and i say hey how you doing tony lustonio she goes hi hi she said so what are you doing here? i said well i'm friends with bert yeah i said no i'm an actor i'm gonna do I said, but I don't really know L.A. Like, I haven't. She's like, you don't know? I was, no, I said, I don't really know anyone. I would love to have someone maybe. You don't know anyone that might be able to take me around L.A., show me something. She's like, well, I'll take you. And I'm like, well, that would be awesome. And I see Tammy looking at me with death. <laughs> <laughs> so we we go out. Like, we we just, we do, um, you know, it takes me around, shows me a couple things. Never touched her. Never was inappropriate with her at all. This is the truth. I go back to my hotel. My phone rings. I'm literally in my hotel room. My phone rings. I pick it up. I'm like, hello? And I hear, is this Tony? And I'm like, yeah. You listen to me and you listen good. You go near my effing sister again. I will bust your effing. I will have your legs chopped off thrown in the Pacific Ocean. You understand me? Am I, and whoa, 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 I go, first of all, don't talk to me like that because I don't even know who you are. Who the hell are you? And he goes, it's Jimmy Khan. I'm like, well, I don't know no Jimmy Khan. So I don't know your sister. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know any of this shit. And don't threaten me. I don't like it. He's like, I'm not kidding. I'm not threatening you. I'm telling you, I will, I will literally have you thrown in an ocean. If, and he's going to, and I said, well, you know where I'm at. You call my hotel room, tough guy. Don't act like, don't try to use my sister to get to me. And I'm like, again, why would I want to get to you? Because I don't even know who the hell you are. It's Jimmy Khan. And I'm like, I don't know no Jimmy Khan. So stop, you know, and we're fighting. And he's like, it's James Khan. And literally, literally in an instant, I went, Oh my, dude, I'm a huge fan. Like literally, <laughs> that's how freaking mental I was. And I'm like, oh, I didn't get, I didn't put it two, two together. And he's like, stay away from, I'm like, listen, calm down. I didn't do anything with your sister. He kind of calmed down. Later in life, I found out that he literally, truly could have had my legs chopped off. Right, right. And it was so cool because I, I met his sister again. And, I, you know, I laughed about it. And she had him sign a picture to my mom. Oh, that's great. You know, which is kind of yeah, cool. That's so and, funny. And then I got, I got into an argument with Bert, and it didn't work out. 
And I kind of was asked to leave Los Angeles. <laughs> and the city of Los Angeles asked you to leave. <laughs> asked me to leave, just like Bishop Newman right. asked me to leave. I, I was up. noticing a pattern, <laughs> yeah. you know? So first it was, you know, a school, then a, then a, a, a whole city. city, a city and of cities, yeah. Next it'll be the state, and then right. finally the country <laughs> will throw me. And eventually, this is planet Earth. We're going to have to ask you to leave. <laughs> Please get off the planet. <laughs> When I came back... You came back to Philly. I came back to Philly, and I met with Franny, who was my ex-wife now, and I was still 17, and I asked her to marry me, and we weren't allowed to get married because we were too young, so we eloped, and we went to Elkton, Maryland. Wow. And got married by a judge, and I started work, never graduated school. Where'd you work? I worked with my dad. Okay, so you worked at the the commissary. The commissary, which was for lunch trucks, and and then she got pregnant, and um, she gave birth at eighteen. I would just uh, I just turned nineteen, and um, my son Tony was born, and then um, three years later, my son Michael was born, and then. Four years later, as my son Joe was born. So when I was 26, I already had three children. Wow. And working all the time, two jobs, worked for Frankie, border, delivering pizzas, making pizzas. I worked the oven. I loved working the oven. And I kind of kind of forgot the entertainment industry. Yeah, so it sounds like for a solid decade, you just kind of worked and, and, and started raising your kids. And well, yeah. And then, but that's not 100% true because I think in 84... When Michael was born, before Joe was born, I started doing the music. Okay. I got into music. I, I felt like I had, um, uh, you know, I just, I felt it. Like, I really felt the music. And I didn't know anything about theory. I knew that I could look at a piano and I could play sounds. And I would string those sounds together into a song. And I would always hear melody lines in my head and lyrics. And I found that I was able to write music without literally knowing anything about music. Wow. So I wrote my first song and I had no musicians to play it. So I remember walking through Center City. Someone told me to go to a place called New Power Conservatory of Music. And I heard the sax player playing. And I remember I walked up the steps because this is the dumb crap that I do. I remember walked in, walked past everyone, literally opened up the door to where this kid was playing in the conservatory. Like, this is where he's learning. And I go, how you doing? And he goes, excuse me? I'm like, Tony Lucidonio, who are you? And he goes, Max Weissman. I'm like, Max, you can play that sax. I'm like, look, I'm a songwriter. I'm a singer. I want you in my band. So I need you to record a track for me. Literally, that's what I that was it. And he looked at me like I had 10 heads. <laughs> And, and he looked at me and he was like, all right. I'm like, we got to get the rest of the band together, but don't worry about it. Then I met Don Rogers, who played drums, and Diane Thompson, who is an amazing uh, keyboard player, and Cheryl McCallis. And I just put this whole band together, and we called ourselves Off the Streets. Yeah. Oh, cool. And we went in and, and we just you know started doing some little four-track recording, and I was introduced to a, um, a gentleman named Philip Calloway. And Philip was a manager, a music manager. Yeah. And he represented a group called Tony, Tony, and Tone at the time. <laughs> I remember hearing their demo before they were even signed through Philip. And I wanted, you know, I wanted a deal. Like I want, I want you know, I thought I want to be a singer. This is what I want to do. I want to make music. And I get picked up by A&M Records. So I'm a young kid. I figure, well, now I made it. So they fly me and um, Mike Tyler, who was the guitar player for me, to Los Angeles. <clears throat> first, not the first time, I'm in the second time. You're back. I'm back. <laughs> I'm back. And I call Tammy. She knows I'm coming. And I don't want to see Bert because I think he's mad at me because we had an argument prior. But like an idiot, I'm thinking he actually remembers. Right. That, yeah, you know, yeah. He remembers nothing, you know. So anyway, I go back. I'm in the studio. And I remember walking in, the a &R guy was there, and I remember him looking at me, because he, all he did was heard, he heard music. Yeah. And he came back to me and he says, um, and who are you again with the band? 
who do you, who, who do you, who do you play? And I'm like, I'm the, I'm the lead singer. Yeah. And he went, no, no, no. Lead singer's black. I'm like, no, no, he's Italian. <laughs> I'll never forget that. I'm like, yeah. he's Italian. Yeah, yeah. He's like, you're the lead singer. I'm like, I'm the lead singer. Yeah. And he kind of looked at me like, now, because this was different back then. It right. was like, and you were doing like R and B music. I was right? doing heavy R and B stuff, you know. And the band was was inter, interracial. To me, it was always just about the music. And I remember me and Mike cut the whole album at A and M. And there is one regret I have. I do have one regret. I was in Studio B cutting the tracks and I was so into it. Like I was just focused into it. And um, they said to me, listen, you want to come next door? Michael Jackson's recording in Studio A. Do you want to meet Michael? And you can hang a little bit. And I literally said, I'm bit like I'm doing the tracks. I'm bit <laughs> I can't. I'm busy. Like I was so focused on my music that now I said, I, I can't believe I had a chance to meet Michael Jackson. And I said, no, I'm too busy yeah. writing. <laughs> yeah. But as a writer, you're in a flow. Right. You don't want to lose it. Right, right, right. My one regret. Well, anyway, we finished the album. And I remember going in to the office. And I said, hey, guys, did you hear the, the demo? Did you hear the album? And they said, yeah. And it's really good. And I said, well, I, I appreciate it. And they said, um, well, we have a problem. I'm like, what's the problem? And he said, look, if I'm going to be honest. We don't know what to do with you. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, look, we can't market you as a black artist because you're not black. And I can't market you as a white artist because you don't do rock. You do R&B. He said, and it's an inter great interracial group. And I, are, the PR, we don't know what to do. Yeah. And I'm like, what do you mean you know what to do? I'm like, you mark it as an R&B track. Yeah. Yeah, but you're white. And I said, well, what does that mean? They were like, you know, we're, we're not going to release it. And I was devastated. Really, and, and hurt. But then as soon as I, they dropped me, uh, Greg Peck from Island Records uh, wanted me. Yeah. So I was excited. And I remember going to, to Greg and I told him and... Island back then, primarily a black label. And I had just realized that I'm in, I'm like, I'm doing music. I'm, 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 the curve hasn't come yet. What's going to be different with, I, you know what I mean, with Island? And God bless him, you know, and Greg was like, because um, I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to fight for you. And we went to K Gem Studios and we recorded. We redid some new tracks. Yeah. And um, it came down between me and an artist then called Miles J. He was very much like a Teddy Pendergrass okay. clone almost, like he sounded. And I didn't get it. And, you know, my first reaction was, again, because the whole, you know, and he's like, look, Tony, he said, I went in and I fought for you. But he gave me a real education. And um, he said to me, do I feel bad that you didn't get it? Yeah. Do I think you should have gotten it? Yeah. Do you want me to feel bad that maybe the fact that you were white doing R&B music might have been a factor in whether they went with Miles right. or you? I'm not going to say yes or no, right. but if you think I'm going to feel bad that maybe you didn't get it because of your skin color, he said, because if you want me to reeducate you, I will. He said, let's go back to the, to the thirties and forties and fifties and sixties right. when all these amazing black artists, uh, you know, white groups were covering their music. They mm -hmm. weren't getting paid anything. He said, so do I think you should have got it? Yes. Do I feel bad that maybe this time it didn't work out the way you wanted it to or the way it has been working out for the last 50 years? No, I don't feel bad about that. And I remember being angry as a kid thinking it's supposed to be about the music. Yeah. Just very oblivious to the fact that all the other artists that came before me, it was about the music for them too. But 
because of their skin color or whatever political reason was, they didn't get it or they were overlooked or it was yeah. given to someone else. And it was kind of like, hmm, you know, like, you know, Greg was like, how's that taste? Yeah, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah. a little, you know and. And so you, you didn't have that sort of <clears throat> perspective of that at the time. Is that something that you No, sort of... because I just kept saying to myself, it should be about the music and only about the music. And as later on in life, as I grew as a person, yeah, as life experiences started to show me more and more, and I started witnessing things on my own, I realized that I should have been incredibly grateful that I was given an opportunity to do something that hadn't really been done or having people in the music industry have that kind of confidence in me to go and push for me. Right. And that you even like got to that. that point. And yeah, to get right. Exactly. I was so angry. I quit music. Wow. You're like, I'm done. I'm done. I said, because it's politics and it's not about the music. And I quit. And I remember just stopping. What at that point did you do? I went back to work. And you were just working stiff. Yeah. I was working f with my dad with the lunch trucks. I hated it. Like, I really hated it because I just wanted to do music. And I remember literally sometimes going into work and just wanting to die. And then I remember in 1992, I had a restaurant called Lucidonio's on 7th and Federal. And I loved to cook and I had learned to cook. You know, my father had a restaurant called Rigatoni's and I had learned from, I learned how to cook from my dad. Some from my mom and my grandmother, but a lot from my dad. Because my dad used to make roast pork and roast beef for parties. And people would love it. They would love his roast pork and roast beef. And my father in 90, 91 called me because he had a commissary for the lunch trucks. He was working with my brother and they had just sold it. And he said to me, why don't we do something as a family? And I found this piece of property and... I think I want to put a sandwich shop on there and we should do that. It's amazing. I, I always said that I, I didn't live a life. I lived lives. The boxing, the martial arts, this was the, the high school, the great, the, the, these were lives. And in every life I changed in every life, something different was added. The creation of Tony Luke's is remarkable. I mean, it's a chapter. I will head this chapter as the making of Tony Luke's. That chapter and the many chapters that ensue can be heard now in part two of this two-part series with Tony Luke Jr. on Philly Who.